Good evening, everyone. Have a good time? Yeah. Did we enjoy the movie? Yeah. Wonderful. Really, really great. Uh, my name is Christopher Cass. I'm the Associate Chair Acting for a Film, in case you didn't know. Uh, welcome. And um, let me tell you quickly about uh, Matt Ross. Uh, actor, writer, and director. He's known for writing and directing the feature Captain Fantastic starring Viggo Mortensen, which we just saw. Before that, Ross made uh, seven short films, including The Language of Love, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. As an actor, he's best known for his roles as Gavin Belson in the HBO series Silicon Valley, Albie Grant in the HBO series Big Love, Glenn Odekirk in The Aviator, and Luis Carruthers in American Psycho. He was also Eddie Scott in the 2005 film Good Night and Good Luck for which he was nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award. In 2011 and 2015, he played Charles Montgomery in the first and fifth seasons of FX's anthology series, American Horror Story. He also directed the feature film, 20 Hotel Rooms, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. And now I'm gonna introduce uh, Tova, who's uh, brought him here and uh, is gonna be the moderator. And we're very appreciative of, of all the work that Tova does for us. Uh, Tobis credits includes Glory with Denzel Washington, Oliver Stone's Nixon, Avida with Antonio Banderas, and Man Madonna and Varsity Blues. And I just found out tonight that she was, her first film was uh, Godfather 2 that she got to work on. So uh, let's give him a big NIFO welcome, please. Thank you. I guess they liked it. They That's really, good. really liked it. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you a question that you probably have been asked a hundred times before. Mm -hmm. What were you thinking? <laughs> In uh, other words, how did you come up with this awesome, unique idea? Um, that's something you re I think I only really put together afterwards. Uh, um, <laughs> wh uh, why I, you know, I mean, how it came together. You, when you're doing it, you're just telling a story. I think there was a, a confluence of probably three or four things going on in my life. <clears throat> I have kids, and I was thinking a lot about being a father, and my failures as a father, my aspirations as a father. Um, uh, having kids wasn't really something that I had given a lot of thought to in, in, in so far as growing up. I never thought, oh, I really always want to be a yeah. father, but then you have kids, and you're like, okay, what kind of father am I going to be? What kind of parent am I going to be? And I was watching my friends have kids and seeing some people I really love and observing their parenting and thinking they were terrible parents. Um, and just really thinking a lot about our country and you know, um, I'm not raising my kids in Western Europe or Japan, I'm raising them here and what does that mean and what, what kind of people do I want them to be? And so I started fantasizing about the kind of father I think I'd like to be and that was probably the genesis of it was um, that. And then you know, you. <clears throat> when you're writing it, there's certain elements of the movie that are, um, it's not autobiographical, but there are certain elements that are from my own life. And that had much more to do with filling in the, what I call the math of the narrative. You know, um, I knew I wanted to tell a story that was transformational. I knew I wanted to start somewhere and end somewhere else. And um, if drama is conflict, you try and create the most conflict possible. And I was raised partially um, in environments like what you see them. My mother is not the Ben Cash character, but there, you know, we lived at one point in a, in, uh, I grew up in Oregon, and um, uh, say no more. <laughs> and we, um, at one point, we lived. Um, it, it was the '80s, not the '60s, so they were not hippie communes. But I did live on a, some communal living situations, and at one point, we lived in a place that was about. Um, five to seven miles from a cement road. So you're really on a dirt road to, you know, um, in the middle of nowhere. And then from there, it was about 30 or 40 minutes to a general store, and then about <laughs> an hour to a town of a thousand. So I lived in the middle of nowhere, at, or actually it was in the middle of somewhere, but it just was not, you know, identifiable. Yeah. We're surrounded by forest, and in the summer we slept in a teepee. And so there's some things that were my life, and the books the kids read, the things they do, those are part of my, things that are part of my life. and you know, you put you put yourself into it. So, are the parents? Are there any parents who think that they are doing a good job with the kids? Of course, until they're In teenager, life? and then you're like, yeah. wash your hands off them. I think you know, there's no perfect parent, and there's no there's no guidebook. You know, right. I mean, you when you have a kid, 
I don't know, I can't see anyone's face, but you're probably all too young, but when you first have a kid, you're like, what the fuck are we doing? What, what, am I, what the fuck do we do? There's a living thing there, and it's like, it's, you know, how do we keep it alive? And, and um, you know, you, you read books. We did a lot of books. And, um, but everyone makes it up as they go along, and certainly we're all reactions to our own parents, either lean in towards the things that we think they did well or against the things that we think they failed at, and you're making it up, and... Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I've had some parents tell me they've seen the movie and it made them feel like a terrible parent, and that was not my goal. I certainly didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I, I hoped that it, was, that it would be aspirational in some way. Let me ask it. you something, because um, I know that just from working with <clears throat> parents in, in the business, um, some people say that it's just so hard for them to reconcile the time that they need to immerse themselves in their profession and mm. the time they need for the family. Mm. And then other people say, well, it just made me focus on what's important, both at work and the thing, and, and it made it work. I mean... Well, for me, it's made me focus. I mean, I lived in New York City in my 20s, and I was a consumer of culture. I mean, I went out every night, and I was constantly going to plays yes. and music and museums. And I did. I ch was trying to write um, and did not as much as I should have been because I was consuming. And when I, you have kids, you're sort of like, okay, I have six hours. I, I'm like, better do something. Um, I also think that you know, for me personally, the great irony of this movie, or one of the great ironies, is that I was off making a movie about trying to be a great parent while my wife was raising my kids in my absence. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, you know, as you all go on with your careers and you, you know, we, are, we live in a culture where at some point people, not everyone, some people have kids, you know, you have to navigate that. And I think it's frankly much easier for men than it is for women. You know, um, many of my friends who are women really struggle with their yes. careers as they have kids. And some of them, you know, famously Meryl Streep raised her. I don't know her, but I read about it. She she raised her kids and then came back to acting. And yeah, um, well, she had yeah. a husband also who stayed home. Yeah, yeah. So you can so, do it. Um, you know, but most of the women who are uh, president of the studios have husbands that actually yeah, stay home. Yeah, you have home. to, or Especially, you pay someone to raise your kids. And yes, I, you know, yes. Um, and so, that's if you're working and you're lucky enough to have the money to do that. You know? Right. So yeah. So, um, <clears throat> how did you get to do this movie? I know that you did seven shorts before mm -hmm. you were a working actor. Mm -hmm. In fact, I told you I saw you on TV on Silicon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> today. But um, how did you start in the business? So, I grew up in Oregon and I made films before I acted. Um, uh, I didn't know anyone uh, who was in the film business at all. And I liked storytelling and some of my first storytelling experiences were in the theater, meaning plays, not movies. And I got involved with theater and acting as a kid. And I didn't, I don't know if I really thought I was going to be an actor. I just liked storytelling and it was a, you know, acting is storytelling and right. it was something I wanted to do and I continued to make films. And then I went to college, I went to Juilliard and trained as an actor. And at the time I got into NYU Film School, I think at the same time. And I, at 17 or however old I was, I did not think or I didn't have very much confidence in my own stories, but acting, there's an infrastructure. You read the play, you're assigned a part, you understand your role. So it was something I felt comfortable doing. And then when I, was, when I graduated from Juilliard, I immediately went to NYU again, but I took sort of like a similar thing where you do like a summer course. Yes. I, didn't, I did not go to film school. I, um, I had a great teacher, a guy named Nick Tannis, and I did what's called sight and sound, which is you make six or eight short films there in a condensed, a condensed period of time. And then the money I made as an actor, I would make sh films, and I kept on making them, and they were getting progress progressively better. Uh, well, not just better quality, but like I had better crews, and they were more professional. And um, uh, there's no money in short films, and this is—I mean, this is ancient history. This is now um, you can make a film on a 5D that look astonishing, or, yeah. or what? Right. What's his last name? Sean, who did um, Tangerine? Yes. Or, what's his last name? Ellis? No. No. Um, anyway. Baker. Baker, yes, yeah, maybe that might be it. Um, uh, you know, so at the time I had to make money as an actor and then I would make it on 16 millimeter film. And um, there was video when I was making them, it just wasn't, it wasn't good enough. Um, I wrote a bunch of films. Um, I, you know, I spent, you know, you talk about, we were talking about Malcolm Gladwell and it's kind of the 10,000 hours. And I wrote many, 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 many terrible screenplays. Um, and I sort of taught myself to write um, in between wanting to kill myself because I thought they were terrible. 
And um, uh, I had some projects that almost happened and didn't. And then I finally wrote something um, called 28 Hotel Rooms, which was a collaboration with an actor a friend of mine named Chris Messina. I actually wrote something and asked a friend of mine, um, uh, an actor named Sam Rockwell, to do it. And it was something I wrote without telling him I was going to do it, which was a stupid idea. Um, the, the film was a, about uh, uh, an alcoholic, and he's basically drunk the whole film, and except at the end when he kind of turns his life around, literally the last scene. And I remember I showed it to Sam, and he's like, this is great, I really like this. I've just played three drunks in a row, and I don't want to play this. And I was like, <laughs> I should maybe have told, told him. But he, we, he and I were talking, and I, um, he said, you know, you should talk to Chris. And so I, um, I pitched something to Chris, and um, he and I started talking about our desires creatively and things we wanted to do. Um, uh, and I pitched him 28 Hotel Rooms, which was born out of um, not really my frustration as an actor at all, but looking for another way of working, which was um, I wanted to make a film where I really collaborated deeply with the actors, inspired by the way Mike Lee works. You know, I mean, Mike Lee is you know, a giant of world cinema, so he can hire great actors and workshop for a year with them. Yeah. I couldn't do that because I didn't have the money, but I wrote a script while Chris was off doing a movie and we did workshop it, he, workshop it, he and I, and then we hired an actress named Marin Ireland, who's a brilliant actress, New York actress. Um, and uh, that film could have been made for no money on the 5D. It's, it's, the film is, <clears throat> the idea, one of the ideas of it is you know, we're a monogamous society and at some point in your life you pair up. Sometimes you meet someone in your life who kind of penetrates and you allow yourself the fantasy of, wow, what would my life be like with that person, yes. you know? And and you don't act on it necessarily, but you you allow yourself that three-second fantasy. And this was, a, this was a movie about these two people who are married to other people and they allow themselves this fantasy, which is a one-night stand, which turns into maybe the most significant relationship of their life, but it's not a real relationship because real relationships are laundry and bills and the dishes and yes. shopping and the fabric <laughs> of our lives, but they're in these hotel rooms. And yes. so after the romance of just sex, they have to, they start, you know, dealing with who they actually are yeah. and yet they can't go, it can go out in public and, and it takes place over the course of like 10 years. And it was very, I mean, by today's standards, it's kind of an experimental film. I didn't think of it as such, <laughs> but it kind of is by, you know, I, my joke when we were making it is that it's a seventies French movie in English. Um, <laughs> uh, and anyway, it was at Sundance and, and then, um, I wrote something. So you got notice. It yeah, but uh, yes, uh, but it's again, you know, I mean, the truth of the matter is, even with huge movie stars, that's not a commercial movie. That's something that you could make on television because the networks are um, are doing more bolder narratives, you know, and um, uh, and by networks, I mean the premier cable networks. Right. Anyway, so um, I wrote that kind of in a, not in a mercenary way because it wasn't about money, but I knew that I, I wrote something that I knew I could make no matter what, and it wasn't contingent about. Uh, uh, on raising a certain amount of money or attaching certain actors. It was, um, and I don't know ultimately if that helped me make Captain Fantastic. The woman who produced Captain Fantastic, Lynette Howell Taylor, yes. is a great producer, produced uh, Blue Valentine, yes. Place Behind the Pines, and recently it's produced from very big movies like The Accountant, and she just produced Star is Born, and she's doing yes. big stuff. Um, she's definitely a creative collaborator um, of mine, and um, and Derek C. and Friends, and other filmmakers, and she, um, I gave her Captain Fantastic when we came back from Sundance, and then it's a matter of um, it was it was put together in a traditional outside the studio system way, which is you attach an actor, and then you um, you find uh, independent financing, which is either private equity or you know um, there are plenty of companies that make films, and um, so that's what we did. Yeah. Amazing. And let me ask you one more question, and then <clears throat> we'll open it up to the students. Yeah. As you made your way after you finished Juilliard and you went acting, um, what did you do to distinguish yourself to be noticed as an actor? I don't know that I ever thought in that way. You know, I, I, I went to Juilliard and Juilliard was very much about being trying to be an artist, you know? It, it, I think in some ways maybe to its own detriment insofar as they didn't really train you for the business. They trained you to be a repertory theater actor, um, which meant that a lot of it was very technical and it was very geared towards 
you know, um, voice and speech and being able to fill a huge house night after night. And, um, uh, you know, any school is only as good as the teachers. And, you know, the people that are teaching you today may not be here in 20 years. And if you talk to someone in 20 years, their experience here is going to be entirely different than yours. And so I was, you know, the, the Juilliard faculty that taught me is not there today. Cause maybe some of them aren't. So, um, in terms of the quality, it shifts all the time. Yeah. And, um, they were, uh, personally, I, I was having an existential crisis when I was at Juilliard, which is that I didn't, I didn't think I wanted to be an actor. Um, I felt like I made a mistake. I was very, um, I loved acting and I loved the craft of acting and I love actors and I love, I love um, the art as well as the craft, but I was having very strong, pull, I, I felt very strongly pulled to doing um, other things than just acting. And uh, so for me, when I got out, I, w I mean, I almost left actually halfway through because I wasn't sure if this was what I should keep doing. Um, so for me afterwards, I, I did a lot of theater. I lived in New York and at that time, um, anytime a film was shot in Canada, there was a lot of film production at the time in, in Toronto and Montreal. And so they would look at the New York acting pool and I got some films and I did that. And, um, uh, but I, I don't know that I was, I don't know that I thought about it in those terms. I think I, you know, the truth is that People talk about careers and I never felt like I had a career. To me, a career implies choice. You know, my choice was always, do I want to audition? And um, if I'm offered something, do I want to try and make the best of it? Or do I want to be a bartender, you know? And, um, <laughs> you know, frankly, you know, it's, uh, that's not a career, that's survival, yeah. you know? So I, to try and answer your question specifically in terms of differentiating yourself, I just think that if we're talking about acting specifically, um, you have to be excellent every time. You know, you can't, you know, it, 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 it requires such a dedication. And, you know, when you're 23 and you're living your young life, it's sometimes hard, you know, you're, yes. you, to, to be so dedicated. You have to, what I learned about auditioning was that um, I was not necessarily auditioning for this part. I was auditioning for three parts down the road that this casting director might remember me for. So my feeling was when I went in, I had to be excellent every time so that they'd be like, you know what, you're totally wrong for this. Yes. Or they bring me back to directors like, it's not great, but he's good. It's, you know, and you, you get champions and casting directors. They're like, I will bring you in yes. because I, you're not anything like what they describe, but you're great and you'll do great. And then, and maybe they'll change their mind, you know, or maybe they'll conceive of it differently. And, you know, you're too young for the part, but maybe they'll, whatever it is. And, and, yeah. um, and then on the other side of the table, I see that a lot. You know, you have to, yes. you know, um, I saw hundreds of kids from all over the world. And sometimes how people get cast is, is strange, you know, and <laughs> random and, um, and not what you would expect. Right. Um, Somebody reminds you of your mother, of your sister, of the thing. Or, There's a yeah, or the, yeah, or they do some, I mean, I don't know. I mean, right. I, can, I can tell you George Mackay, who plays Bo Bodovin, the, the older, he was, he was, um, he came to LA, he's English. He came to LA, I was not here, I was scouting in Washington State, and I saw his tape. I saw a lot of people on tape because I was scouting at the time. We also did long audition processes in LA with the kids. And I, there's something about him that I liked, and I Skyped, his callback was Skyped. And um, I could tell that he was really facile as an actor, and I asked him to be brave, and, to, and I said, so that you know the speech, where he, there's two, the, the audition scenes for Bodovin were um, giving the dad the letters, which is an emotional moment yes. for him, and when he's proposing to the woman, which is really a acting gymnastics. That's really hard, I think, to believe that, that's, that he's actually thinking that way, that this, this kid is um, contextualizing romantic love out of like a 19th century English novel. So he's kissed this woman, he's never kissed anyone before, he's fallen in love and he thinks the honorable thing to do is to ask her. That's, yes. you know, that's pushing it. So, and, and it's a lot to do. And so he did a lovely audition and I loved what he did. And he was, he was prepared and he was off book. And I said, hey, would you um, 
just improvise that speech? Would you just, you know what, you know what the sort of trajectory is, forget the words, just go in with the intention of what you're doing and, and you can say whatever you want. And we did it a bunch of ways. And he was so, it was astonishing, not just for what he said, some of what he said, I kept and asked him to do when we shot it, like <laughs> adrenaline through a dolphin or whatever he was saying, like that, that was like crazy and I loved it. And I was like, yeah, do that again. Um, but but it was emotionally. I watched him. He was. It forced him to be present in a way, and it showed me how game he was, and how facile he was, and how quick witted he was. And I saw on his face fear and love and terror, and and then when she leaves, devastation. There was all these things that came up, and um, you know. So that that's actually an example of someone who got the part not because of the preparation they did. Well, partially the preparation that made him available in that way. So, you know, everyone's done that. Okay, so we're going to open up to the students. Please line up. Um, so my question as I wrote it, uh, considering <laughs> the juxta juxtaposition between children and death, uh, did you feel insecure about the ways that your characters, specifically the children, were processing grief? Just like like the idea of like children and death, they're mm -hmm. like polar opposite, like youth and, and uh -huh. death. Yeah. Um, did you ever feel insecure about like the way that the characters, specifically the kids, were dealing with, like they, the way they were grieving, basically? No. Do you mean in terms of the making of the film or just conceptually? Uh, like, like did I, did, was I worried about manifesting grief with child actors? Or, or is that I think I mean more like the script ideas, like when you were writing it, like the ways, like when they're on the bus with their mom after they've taken her and that sort of thing, like were you at all insecure about the idea of like a child, you know, sitting with their dead mother, you know, like that no. sort of thing? No, no, I mean, I, 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 you know, Vigo's character says in the film, I don't lie to my kids. And that was kind of, an, uh, you know, sort of the operating thesis of, of that. So, no, I think we, um, we are all infantilized and infantilized kids <laughs> far more than they probably need to be. I mean, you don't have to go that far in history before kids. There was like, you know, kids were working in factories at eight, eight and, and going back farther, you know, pr um, primitive cultures, so-called primitive cultures, kids are hunting and, you know, at a very, as, as soon as they can, you know, yeah. so um, I didn't have any insecurity about it. I, I, in terms of like how people would perceive it, I didn't know, you know, um, but no. Did I answer that question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I think that scene is one of the most amazing scenes I've seen. Basically. Which one? The kids crying? No, with the mother oh, and, and the, uh, and the yeah. funeral. Yeah. And the flowers yeah, was... and the singing and the beauty of it as opposed to... Uh, that actually the... came... Um, uh, showing her uh, was not in the script. Um, they were all around her closed casket and Vigo suggested that we see her, which meant flying the actress from Washington to um, uh, uh, New Mexico, um, which is a cost. Um, but I loved that idea. It was fantastic. I hadn't thought of it and, you know, he contributed many excellent ideas that made the movie better. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hello. <laughs> How does the uh, onset dynamic and environment as an actor change when you're working on a, a film like American Psycho mm -hmm. with an actor like Christian Bale, mm -hmm. as opposed to working on a comedic series like Silicon Valley alongside comedians like T.J. Miller and Kumail? Um, I don't think there's any difference. You know, you're, I, I suppose the big difference uh, and I don't come from comedy, you know, I'm not an improvisational or stand-up comedian, so they would probably be able to answer that question better than I, I can. I'm, I'm more a fish out of water in that world. But I think it's all problem solving, and for comedy, you, you have the added difficulty of identifying and, uh, and illuminating what's humorous, whereas I think with drama, you're maybe a little more focused on um, uh, illuminating the perceived truth, though I think it's the same goal. You know, I'm, you, know you play comedy, C certainly in Silicon Valley, there's no external tone, you know what I mean? Everyone's playing it as if it's the real world and these are real people. It's not like, and there are some, you know, comedic tones vary. I mean, you can, you can look at Life of Brian or a Monty Python movie or we can name certain comedies that have external tones and we're not doing that. Um, so I think it's the same thing, which is just, 
you know, you're you're solving the acting problems and um, and trying to be truthful. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for the film. Thank you. Um, my question is that you have a huge ensemble cast mm. and you have many age groups in the film. Mm. So how was your experience dealing with all different kind of maturities when it mm. comes to actors mm -hmm. and characters? Well, you know, they say never work with kids or animals and we had, <laughs> we had, we had both and, and we had kids in every scene. They're not difficult in the ways that people think they're difficult at all. You know, George Mackay is the oldest as a professional actor. Um, the two young women uh, had acting experience and had been some stuff and they've continued to do stuff. The youngest boy, Charlie Shotwell, had never acted before and now has a great career. <laughs> um, uh, Shri Crooks, who played um, Zaja, um, had done some commercials and is, she was on, I think she's on Ray Donovan and she's done some acting. Um, uh, Nicholas Hamilton had been in some, who plays Relly and had been in some movies and has continued to work. So some of them had act, they all had some acting experience. The difficulty is not, um, I didn't find the acting problems difficult. The, the hardest things is some of them is they were having too good of a time and so they're <laughs> fucking around too much. And, and I'm stressing about the fact that we're losing light or we only have an hour to shoot a scene. And so sometimes I was like, focus guys, focus. Um, uh, you also can't expect uh, the youngest ones to um, be in the pocket emotionally uh, uh, in real time. You know, professional actors, whether you rehearse it or not, over repetition, sort of getting into a groove, you know, like jazz musicians talk about being in the pocket. And, and if it's your line, my line, your line, his line, your line, blah, blah, blah. And you have to, you know, you have to, you have to be there temporally. Kids are like, they're, they may not, they need more time. It's not, they're not, it's not a play. We haven't had five weeks of rehearsal. So some of the youngest ones, and I'm, Charlie was, I don't know, seven, eight, I don't know. He was really young, maybe nine. I can't remember exactly, but you know, sometimes I would have to break down the, the way we shoot things and I'd just put a camera on him and I would talk to him or Vigo would talk to him and we would try it a variety of ways. Um, uh, and I would just play with him and sometimes Vigo would push him if I needed to be, to be louder or angry or whatever and sometimes I would just ask him, I would just, I would give him flavors. So, um, but you know, I, it was um, a rare experience when I only had adult actors on set, you know, like um, Vigo and Franklin Jella is an example of where there's only adults in that scene. You know, almost every other scene there's kids and the truth, the real answer to your question is that everyone, whether they're an actor or not, has their own process. And one of my jobs is identifying what people's process is, is what their process is, and creating an environment where their process can flourish. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. That works. Hey. Hello. Thanks. So uh, you talked about how your own parenthood sort of inspired the making of this story. Mm. And I think parenthood in this film is sort of a very strong theme. Mm. And I like it very much. But what really sort of fascinates me is the theme of sort of cultural struggles. Mm -hmm. Or the sort of like conflict between different cultures mm -hmm. or like societies, if you will. And I was just wondering... Like, I think you draw a very perfect line between these two worlds and how they collide. And then in the end, there's sort of, you figure out that none of them is really fully right. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is this something that you wanted to show from the beginning? Or did it sort of just develop as you fleshed out the story? I think as an actor and as a director or as a writer, you're, you're sometimes given credit for things you had nothing to do with. And, <laughs> and sometimes you're blamed for things you had nothing to do with. Like yeah. you said you love the fact that the, the mother is, you know, exposed. Well, that was Vigo's idea, you know, right. um, and I get credit for it. Um, uh, <laughs> but there are some things that were intentional to address your question. I wanted to create um, characters that were always in gray and that there were no heroes and no villains. So that, you know, when I was talking to Franklin Jella early on, and he, he brought this up, not I, but, you know, I said to him, you're antagonistic towards Vigo, but you're not the antagonist. And it was designed for me, or I tried to design it, at least that was my hope, so that you'd get to the point in somewhere in the late, the end of the second act or beginning of the third act, somewhere in there, that you'd be introduced to this character and think, oh my God, he's right. And this person that I've spent an hour and a half with thinking is the hero is actually very flawed. Now, I think there are some signposts 
you know, early on, like, he steals from a supermarket. There's no way you can, I think, justify what he's doing other than grief. It's bad parenting. And that was intentional as well. Um, I think um, you're right culturally. I was aware of one other thing, which is that I was, um, I thought, I always say there are many Americas within the United States of America, and I was aware of three examples of, of, of American culture and three examples of parenthood. In the beginning, it's a rural America, which is usually, when they're off the grid, a kind of red state America. In this case, it's more of a blue state because they're kind of politically progressive. A suburban America, the Steve Zahn and Catherine Hahn characters, which is most of America. And the wealthy uh, conservatives, frequently religious, but not necessarily America, of like golf course communities and gay communities, and as exemplified by Franklin Jell and Dowd. And you see three pretty distinct parenting styles, too. There were more parenting scenes about how Franklin Joe would parent if he got the kids that were cut. But um, so I was aware of, I would say, those two things: keeping everyone in a state of, you know, gray, and then showing the kind of um, three examples of parenthood and, and what I thought um, uh, three examples of our culture. But what he was asking is, did you have it all figured out from the beginning that this is where you're going, or was it got fleshed out as you start reading the script, uh, writing the script. Is that what you were asking? I mean, I think you sort of explained that you want all the characters to be in gray. <coughs> so it's like neither one is the hero, or really the bad guy. So I think that sort of explains Beautiful. it because I think that's one of the real magic is that like everyone is kind of entitled to their own opinion. And in the end, you yeah. figure out that yeah. maybe you're wrong yourself. So yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, I mean, the, the, I very much like the idea that the screenplay is a living, breathing thing and that people come in and contribute to it. But there were certainly things that, uh, you know, I didn't, sometimes I would ask, like, what's your message? And I don't have a message. I think film is a very poor medium to deliver a message. Anytime I see a movie with a message, I find it incredibly condescending. But I think it's a great medium for asking a lot of questions. Hopefully you provide a wealth of material that the audience, every individual person has their own experience. And you and I can see a movie and argue about what it meant. And we extrapolate our own ideas based on, you know, that's not to say to be lazy. You have to do the work and answer those questions. But um, I like ambiguity with depth. <laughs> All right. I like my much. ambiguity with that. Yes. And peanut butter and chocolate with my ambiguity too. And by the way, what I meant is not so much exposing the <clears throat> mother, but the whole funeral scene mm. and the way it unfolded and the beauty of it mm. rather than the conventional way of burying people. Yeah, well, that's my And fantasy. how it turned into celebration. Yes, that was intentional. I think that, you know, in a Judeo-Christian society, um, we've all been to uh, these doleful... Um, uh, funerals and we're mourning the passing of a human being but I also thought what if you celebrate their life yeah. you know and um, I think I would rather be I'd rather people laugh about all this stupid shit I did rather than say I'm, I'm dead it's gone it's done so, uh, <laughs> yeah. hi how are you good I just want to say that I actually showed this film to my dad and awesome. we had this experience because a lot of, I had seen it before without him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the dialogue, especially with the bus scene, where they're talking about be more specific, mm -hmm. I had those conversations with my dad. So it's good dad. We had like, <laughs> we had those moments. You were asking him to be more specific or he was asking you to be more specific? <laughs> yeah, he was asking me whenever I would have to read in like yeah. middle school and all that. He's like, tell me what you read, not like the whole plot. And yeah, I'd yeah. always go for the plot. So yeah, okay. I just want to say my question is actually, it's kind of like now that you said it, but about Bo at mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. So with the part when he's like making the decision to actually just put a finger on the map mm -hmm. and everything, we are supposed to think, I just am curious, we're supposed to think that that's what he actually wants, that the whole thing with the mom was just like kind of like them together and he didn't want to let that go. Is that what you wanted us to think with him choosing that? I would want, I mean, I'll tell you what I was thinking, okay. but that's not necessarily what I want you to think. I mean, for me... Um, he does want to go to university, but over the course of the film, he also realizes that that's not really what he needs. Um, it, I, I think he wants to... His character is, is somewhat autobiographical in the sense that it's not like I got into all these great schools, but I grew up in a rural area and wanted to get the fuck out. And so I certainly uh, uh, felt that. Um, I think he's, he's, he's overdue to leave. Mm -hmm. He's of an age where it's... It's time for him to leave the nest. And so college is a way out for him. 
And I think over the course of the film, he realizes that really what he needs to do is see the world and have some experiences outside of his own family unit, meet people, fall in love, get his heart broken, um, and then maybe go to university. Okay. So for me, that's really, you know, what it is. It's not that, you know, I, if you're asking me and I, I you know, I, there's no answer because yeah, it's whatever no, you think. Okay. I think he spends a year traveling the world and then maybe goes to college, maybe, okay. you know, awesome. afterwards. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Hello. Uh, I really enjoyed the movie. There Thank you. were uh, so many funny moments. Oh, good. good. And um, uh, I didn't expect to like uh, to experience them today, but it was just hilarious. Good. Thank good. You. Good. So my my question was, um, when you were writing a script, um, were you sure that you will get finance for your film, or, and and how that affected your writing, if it affected your writing? Like, was that question in your mind while you were writing? And did it affect like the places, locations where it would take place or actors that you would have? I didn't have anyone in mind when I was writing it. And I, I've said this a lot, so I'm repeating myself if you've listened to any podcasts that I've talked on, already, which is that <clears throat> I, I, um, you don't know who you're going to have access to. And if you have access to those people, you don't know if they're going to be available. So I didn't presuppose that I would have those things, and I feel it's somewhat of a fool's errand to write. If you, if you, there's an actor you have in mind because their voice, their cadence, or whatever helps you write, that's fine. But I wouldn't be attached to that one person. So I didn't have anyone um, in mind when I was writing it. In terms of locations, and you know, this is not a movie that takes place on another planet with spaceships and uh, you know it's not it doesn't require a 200 million dollar budget so there is a version of this movie with a less famous actor and um, shot differently and is made for you know a fourth of the budget and um, you know any and every film is difficult to finance um, and um, but I I I wasn't I was not writing for specific locations I mean I um, insofar as locations that I thought would be inexpensive. I was writing for specific locations because I know those states and I know those places, but, you know, um, yeah. Are there any places in the film that you've been to? Yeah, I've been all specific? over the state of Washington. And, um, you know, the, the real truth here is that you can't make a film that's not shot in a, sta in a state, at least in this country, that doesn't have a tax incentive. Um, uh, at least that's been my experience. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, we had certain offers from some states to invite business, but I did. I really wanted to shoot in the Pacific Northwest because I'm from there, and I. It, it doesn't matter except for the fact that it's meaningful to me, and I don't. And I also think there are parts of the country that aren't seen a lot. Um, I would have been fine shooting in Oregon. I've lived in Washington, and I've done a lot of camping all over the state, so I know locations really well. That was helpful when I was talking to the location scout. I was like, what about that forest? What about, you know, this place? I know this, this you know, I've been camping here. Um, that was helpful. But um, the second half of the film was written for Arizona, which if you've been to Arizona, places like Scottsdale have a specific culture and a specific wealth that I wanted to, a certain class that I was trying to depict. New Mexico does not have that, which I didn't know because I'd never been there. Um, I was really looking for a kind of golf club community, gated community culture, and that does exist in spades in Arizona, but does not exist in New Mexico, so we had to make it up. Finding that house, there were a lot of scenes that were cut from the script, and from the movie, that took place in that house, that we needed a, a house that, I mean, I really wanted a, a, a huge home um, with a screening room, and there was a scene in all sorts of different rooms, a pool, there's a tennis court, all this stuff. I was depicting a, a particular kind of culture and class and um, we couldn't find it and, and we had to look all over and we finally found this lovely family that allowed us to use their home. Um, so we built it, basically. I mean, we, we built it insofar as their yard was just a grass knoll and we put, you know, golf, I don't know what you call them because I don't play golf, but those, you know, when you hit it in the hole, there's a flag on it, golf yeah. flag, so I have to make it look, and put a caddy out there and made it look like they lived on a golf course. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, what about this scene with the fountain, uh, with the waterfall? So that was a, a, an improvisation insofar as in one of the locations we were at, I saw that, and I asked Vigo if he'd go climb down there and go under the waterfall at lunch. And so Stefan, the cameraman, and I, and Vigo, and there may have been like the AD, just while everyone was eating lunch, we went down and shot that as long as, 
as long as he could stand it because it was um, very cold and <laughs> and very forceful. I mean, I in my mind's eye, he was like this, just, but he couldn't, it was so strong, he could, it was just like beating him down, he couldn't do it. Um, so he shot it from a couple different, a couple different angles and, and, and I didn't know when, when, when and how I would use that and it just became a kind of lovely um, motif that's in fact um, repeated, it's very subtle, but my editor called it the water motif, which is um, at, before he tells the kids, he goes to that to kind of purify himself and then later on before he tells the kids he's gonna leave them, he's taking a shower and it's it's not it's not it's nothing. But we repeated that kind of motif. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, hi, I really enjoyed this film. It really reminded me of my big brother, who has like a real mindset of Viggo Mortensen's main uh, character. Cool. And uh, my question is, what made you attached to this project? Do you feel identified with any particular character, and why? Uh, when I wrote it, I, I was conscious of identifying with the father in terms of my aspirations about being a parent. I think afterwards I realized that I was much more Beau um, in the sense that, um, as I said before, I grew up in an area that I wanted to escape and that was something that emotionally um, uh, I wasn't aware of, but as, I was, as we were making, as we were done making it, I looked at it, I was like, oh, that's much more who I am in some ways. But, um, you know, you take whatever you take and I'm sure most of you aren't parents, but for me it was about um, having an idea about the community you wanted to create, and as a father, you create a little community, um, and and you and you curate that, and the choices you make and how they affect other people, positively and negatively. That was what it was about for me. Okay, thank you. Sure. It's also official. You've written down your questions like it's homework. Wow. It's very official. <laughs> so this was the uh, the first time I had seen the film. It mm -hmm. was I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, but I actually knew you from American Horror Story mm -hmm. uh, before seeing this. Mm -hmm. So um, I looked up your IMDb before coming in, and I just uh, looked at a lot of the stuff you did. And um, I just wanted to know if having worked on so many films and TV shows, and there's uh, been a number of pretty great directors that you've worked mm -hmm. with, uh, was there anything in particular um, that you picked up from them? Any methods or techniques or just tips, advice? I've been asked that before, and I sadly don't have any perfect um, uh, answer for that or with examples. I think the truth is that it has helped me without a doubt because if you talk to directors who aren't actors, they're always so curious how other directors work. and there are never two directors on a set. Um, and I've been a spy in the house of love a lot. Um, and, and, you know, I cherish some of the experiences I've had. I, I don't, every director has their own way of working and I've cribbed some of the things that I liked. You know, every person you meet um, is a teacher. They teach you how to be or how not to be. Um, and I've developed my own um, methodology over time. You know, I was, one of the great joys of my acting life was getting to be in The Aviator and watch Martin Scorsese work, who's one of the great living masters. And, but I can't give you an example of one thing he did that was unique to him that I stole. You know, I, um, patient, filmmaking is time and money and um, uh, patience and collaboration um, are my operative words. So, you know. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Hi. Hello. Um, so this is an eccentric family, right? Yeah. I want to know how close did you work with the production designer and the costume designer to like achieve this look? Yeah. Uh, the production designer is um, Russell Barnes and the costume designer is Courtney Hoffman. And um, you know when you're interviewing people, just like when an actor comes in and auditions and you say, oh, that was great, try it this way. You're, you're, they're basically doing the same thing. They Sometimes people come in with boards, they come in with photographs, they sort of giving you an idea of what they would do given the job, and so it starts there. Um, you know, I'm, as I said, just to answer his question about collaboration, um, I'm learning in my own career about how to collaborate when collaborating too much, when I'm not, when I'm not get, when I'm allowing other people's ideas to supersede mine, um, and I think I'm getting better. Um, I felt like I, uh, in terms of those two specific designers, um, I feel like it was a very healthy collaboration, 
and I probably uh, deferred to them more than I will continue to do because there's some things in the film that I felt were not exactly what I wanted and what I meant. On the other hand, you know, it becomes its own thing and I, some, I, I, I always operate whether I'm dealing with the actors or the DP or the costume designer that more that I, I never negate anyone's ideas before I hear them and frequently their ideas are better than mine and I can give you countless examples that Courtney brought to the movie that were far better than my ideas. You know, there were, there were some, in the script there's some indications of what I meant or what I was thinking, and she said yes, but or yes, and, and they were better. And you know, so the things that I may not like are far less than the things that were better. Um, uh, Vigo brought in the Jesse Jackson shirt. That was his own shirt <laughs> from his. You know, uh, that wasn't in the script. Uh -huh. That's a perfect example of collaborating. I when I first saw it, I thought I'm not sure about it because to me it feels like a joke. It feels like a callback joke, and and early audiences laughed at it, and I thought. That's, that's taking him out of this moment that I didn't like. But I came to realize that, I mean, it's, here's the thing. Courtney and Russell are great storytellers, ultimately. That's, that's the salient point, is that they're telling stories the same way an actor tells a story with their voice or their emotions or whatever. They're telling stories with the costumes. So Courtney did things like she could give the younger kids, uh, at one point, um, one of the, either Vesper or Keeler is wearing a, a jean jacket that says bow on it. Now, if you see that, that's a story. That's saying that that was Bo's jacket and is being passed down, right? And so they're a family that passes down clothes because they have to. That's storytelling, and she's using costumes to do that. There's countless examples. I had Nye in like a, a superhero costume or something because when I was a kid, I cherished my Batman costume. She's like, I don't know about Batman. That seems too pop cultural. What if he has a whale costume that they made? That's one of my favorite things in the movie. I love it. You know, that was not my idea. So... Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And was there anything like specific that you wanted? Uh, that I wanted? Yeah, like, I don't well, like... Well, you know, I mean, I've told this to Courtney. One of the things I said from the before in the beginning was that, and this is about, you know, this is a, about collaboration in general, is that I said they're not hippies. Um, and to me, the end product is a little too hippie-ish. Mm -hmm. A combination of Vigo's long hair, mm -hmm. some of the... Now, if you have no money or you're being very careful about your money, you're going... You're, you're making your clothes, you're doing vintage clothing, which I did when I was a kid. We didn't have money, so we'd get vintage clothing. And so you kind of look like a 70s rock band, you know what I mean? <laughs> and and we, I had some, in the script there was a lot more animal skins and stuff. The way it manifested, to me it kind of looked like a bad Star Trek episode. So we were like, okay, let's not do that, let's do this. Um, so, you know, it, it became its own thing. Um, and I don't know if I did this exact movie again, I would I would have learned those lessons and avoid them a little more. I didn't want tie dye, but there's tie dye, you know, and mm -hmm. it's okay. It is what it is. Okay, thank you. you know. Hey there. Hello. Uh, I was wondering, are there any moments from the creation of the film that have stuck with you, whether it be like favorite memories that you had with actors or crew, or else like just scenes that you weren't positive were gonna work, but then just in the moment really clicked? Sure. Um, two moments early on, you know, when you're making anything, you know, in the back of your mind, everyone's like, is this working? Does this work? Do we have a movie? And sometimes there's a moment where you're like, oh, okay, ah, this might work. I'm, I had two of those early on. Everyone was really nervous about the scene when he comes in and says, your mommy's dead, and everyone, and because in the script it was written like they cry like it's a Greek tragedy, it's primal and painful, and I, I, the description of it indicated a certain end result. And everyone was nervous, meaning the production, everyone was nervous, like, can, is this gonna happen? Can they do this? Having one human being cry is difficult enough and have that be realistic, and then you have you know six kids that are, many of whom are children, I mean like very young. And I had no fear, I just thought we'd get there, we'd get there. And um, it was, uh, you know, things happened organically. Charlie Shotwell is not crying at all, the youngest one who plays Nye, he's looking around like, what's going on? Mommy's dead, what did you say, what? And Shri is too, and I was like, that seems real to me. The other ones, the older kids were so connected and some of them needed certain things and I talked to them, took them aside. But we had to shoot that, as you all know, you shoot it over and over and over again. We were shooting crying for an hour or whatever it was. Um, and when that scene happened, I thought, okay, something, they're, they're, these kids are really emotionally connected. Um, and that made me happy. And then the other thing that happened 
um, was that was not uh, something that I thought was in this in this script. Um, there was a very brief moment where it said Vigo sees his dead wife, and it said you didn't know if it was a dream. Uh, she's she's laughing, but you don't hear her voice. She's talking, but no words come out. And it's this kind of weird kind of um, moment that was um, not surreal, but certainly not. It, it was it was intended to be um, uh, a moment that was kind of the manif his, his manifest of his pain and anxiety and 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 most likely a dream sequence, right? The actress who played the part, Trin Miller, um, was a local actress, and because there was no parts, there was no language, I had to read all those people for the part that, um, uh, uh, for the, the mother in the trailer park. Um, and uh, so they were reading for lines that weren't theirs. And she came in, and we were originally gonna shoot it the way it was written. And I said, did you read the script? And she said, yes, I did. I read it many times, twice. So it's great, okay. So she understood the context. And then I asked them to improvise. It was at, we started shooting it at like three in the morning in the teepee and on a Friday night. And they, she and Vigo improvised for a couple hours. And, and she was so um, empathetic and warm. And they were, they were making each other laugh. And at one point she made Vigo cry. And, and that, when I saw that happen, I almost, I cried. I was like, you know, you're watching something happen in real time that you hadn't predicted or um, even orchestrated in a way, or you create the environment for it to happen. And when that happened, I thought, okay, um, it was just so exciting to me. It was pure creation. And her ability to do that, because she's an actress. She's not an extra, she's an actress. She and some extras are actresses, but she's a you know she's a theater actress and now a film actress. She um, because of that, I loved what they did. That I used it twice. So there's the, there's another scene, another callback with the the mother. At that it, over the course of that first week of filming, I was trying to bring in the mother as much as possible. There's photographs of her. We were doing all this stuff. We had wedding photos and like I was trying to bring her presence in as much as possible. Um, and when I, when she did that thing, it was, it was beautiful. And, 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 you know, she, she expanded her part. <laughs> it's much bigger um, than it was in the script. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that sure. was very lovely. Sure. So we're wrapping up. I just okay. wanted to ask what's next for you. Oh, I have no idea. Um, I did, you know, when you have a small movie, you spend, I spent six months you know, we went to Sundance, we went to Cannes, I went all over the country right. promoting it, then it comes out, then I went all over the world with Vigo, and then we were fortunate And now enough, we ask you here. Yeah, and then we were fortunate <laughs> enough to have the, the, the awards season, I did all that, and yeah. I've been writing, I've been writing for four months, and so um, I've had lots of lovely offers and possibilities, and I'm trying to um, write my own, uh, my own films. You know, I want to attempt to fail to the best of my own abilities, and um, so I'm writing two screenplays, and I hope one of them is next. Well, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate coming here it's because it was post the award and post all of that, mm -hmm. and you want to move on, and we brought you no, back I'm, here nice to talk time. about it. So, yes. But we were so floored by this movie Thank that you. we really had to bring you here Thank and you. share it really with the students and um, see what's in your head. Pretty little weird hair. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you. And I want to really, really thank you for coming here. My and great pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you.